Good morning, friends. Allow me to welcome you again to today's service. We begin, uh, as usual, with a Bible study. And as you are aware, except you are a visitor, you know that we have been uh, undertaking a, a journey which we have just begun in the book of Proverbs. We are undertaking a journey in the books, in the book of Proverbs. And today, we shall be tackling an aspect of that book, which I have titled, The Wisdom of Parents. Okay, that is going to be our topic this morning, The Wisdom of Parents. Let us read the word of God together from the book of Proverbs. For the flow of it, we can read from verse 1 to 9. Uh, today we will basically be uh, concentrating on verse 8 and 9. But just for the flow of it, also as a reminder, we could read from number 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and a pendant, and a pendant for your neck. So then, um, when we began to help us uh, just recap a bit, you remember that we looked first at who the authors were, the authors of the book of Proverbs. We looked at that. Then we looked at the purpose. This was actually verse 1. Then we looked at the purpose and value of the Proverbs. This was verse 2 to 6. Okay? If you recall, that was verses 2 up till 6. Then we looked at the foundation of, of, of wisdom. The foundation or basis or beginning of wisdom. That was verse 7. Okay? Those are the, the, the parts that we have looked at. If, if, if this helps you to remember where we are coming from, it will be good because then when we now go to parental wisdom, it will make sense. It will make better sense, hopefully. We saw in verse 7 particularly that the beginning of knowledge is knowing who God is. For you to have knowledge, and you remember what we said about what wisdom is said, isn't it? Knowledge is a collection of facts eh? which people learn or are taught. But then wisdom is the means of applying those facts in a correct way. In a way that will be helpful to you in daily living. And we saw that the book of Proverbs is written for you and I, for, for, for our daily life, so that we can be able to live right before God as wise people, not like fools. All right? And we saw even the sources of, of, of wisdom we, in, when we looked at the foundation. We looked even at the sources of wisdom, where you can get wisdom from. And we said 
one of the ways you can get wisdom is, is, is experience. Summary, isn't it? Experience. You go through it, you find out what happens, then you know, oh, okay. so this is what happens when you do this. So you have that experience. Mtoto akililia wembe, mpe. Isn't it? Then it cuts, the, the, the wembe cuts the child, the child knows this thing is able to produce a cut. And the cut is very painful, like it will bleed. So I don't want to play with this one. So that is experience. But we also say that the best way is to get wisdom from God. Because the wisdom that is from God is true and tested. You remember me saying those words. That wisdom is true and tested. In any event, that kind of wisdom comes from wisdom himself. For God is wisdom. Don't we sing here, uh, immortal, invisible, God only wise. In other words, there is no wisdom that is not God. That is not from God. He is all wise. He knows everything. But he is even the one who has created us, isn't he? So then he would know how best we should be able to apply whatever knowledge we have wisely. So we saw that the beginning of wisdom really is to fear God. Is to fear God. And we describe what it means to fear God. And those who fear God will more likely heed his wisdom, isn't it? Than fools. The wisdom of God is good for fools. But they won't use it, unfortunately. You understand what I'm saying? Those who don't have a relationship with God, we say the fear is a relational fear. Those who do not have a relationship with God then may hear of his wisdom, but not use it. For them it is not useful. The Bible says they despise. Did you see those words in the, in the Bible? Fools despise wisdom and they loathe instruction. Right? But the same God tells us in verse 8 that we should listen to our parents. The same God. Look, there it is there in verse 8. Hear my son, your father's what? Instruction. And don't forsake your mother's teachings. Sometimes when we are doing this kind of Bible study, you wish only young people were inside here, isn't it? For, for us to tell them that they need to take this seriously. But this is not only written for young people. It is also written for, for us. Especially those of us who still have parents. Even though we have beards, isn't it? Even though we have beards if we are men, eh? but we still have parents. God still grants. Unfortunately, I don't have biological parents anymore. But some of you still have parents. And so it gives instructions not only to the very young people who are younger than us, but even to us that we should obey Listen to. Listen to. Our parents' instructions. I want us to see carefully the words that have been used. Sorry I've strayed and said obey, but that is not used. What has been used is here. Here has been used and do not forsake. Those are the two terms used. And I'm using the ESV. 
which I trust as that now is the best translation of the original text. And they translate whatever was written to hear and do not forsake. What is it to hear? What do you understand by the word hear? Yes, sir. Pay attention. Pay attention. Yes? Hear. What is it to hear? Yes? To be keen. Be keen. Or keenness. When they are talking to you or when they are giving instructions. Yes? From Fossi. Are we, are we together? Pastor had given this class the name of Form 4C. <laughs> Otherwise, we will move to Form 4A and teach there. Yes? To listen. To listen. And remember, we are also coming to this one. Eh? So let us exhaust this one. What does it mean to hear? To hear. When someone tells you, hear me, for example. What does he mean or she mean? To get what I'm saying, isn't it? This is three, this is four. Get what is said. Isn't it? To be able to grasp knowledge. Isn't it? To, to grasp and understand what has been said. Doesn't hearing have something to do with understanding? Understand, isn't it? You, you must be able to understand where your parent is coming from, isn't it? Isn't it? Does it not have something to do with considering? Doesn't it? You must consider what you are being told. When, some, when you hear the preaching of God's word from the pulpit. Are you not supposed to consider it? Isn't it? Does it not have something to do with taking into account? Isn't it? it doesn't it have to do with taking that which you've been told into account? As you make whatever decision you're making, you take into account, you have heard what your parent has, has said. That, that this is what it means to hear. Hear your parent. Hear. Hear what the parent is saying. Take it into account. Consider it. Be keen and pay attention to it. Isn't it? Pay attention to it. Be keen. Take it into account. Consider. And see, this comes immediately after we have been told to be, to listen to God, isn't it? That God is, uh, fearing him is the basis of knowledge, is the foundation of knowledge, is the beginning of knowledge. The very next person he wants us to listen to is the parent. Now look at Exodus chapter 20. Look at Exodus chapter 20. Those who are here when we did the series of, of the Ten Commandments will recall how we say that the commandments are divided into how many segments? Two. The first segment, what was the term we used to refer to it? The first segment. It was the 
our class. The, the vertical. We had a vertical segment and then we had a, a horizontal segment. Now, if you look at the arrangement of the ten, and these are the ones that Christ would later summarize into those two important commandments, isn't it? Loving God and then loving your neighbor, isn't it? But now, even if you look at the Ten Commandments, the same way that the Proverbs is set out in terms of where to get knowledge and instruction is the same way. First, from verse 1 until verse 11, we are dealing with the vertical, the relationship with God, isn't it? I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You sh number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything, and then you shall not bow down in verse 5 to those things that you have made. Then there is the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Verse 7. Are you there? Then verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and do what? Keep it holy. Don't work on that day. Even your servants, even your animals, Six days, you, uh, for six days, the Lord made the heavens, verse 11, and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and then he rested on the seventh day. Verse 12. What? The parents come next. So we have dealt with God. The next person he focuses our attention to is the relationship we are going to have with our biological parents. Or if they are not biological parents, well, the parents who are bringing you up. Because sometimes people are brought up by those who are not their biologi biological parents. Honor your father and your mother. So that is the first place of relationship that God seems to be concerned with after a relationship with himself. So that after we learn to fear God, Solomon tells us to hear our father's instructions. Any comments up to that point before we look at the first part of it? That was just an introduction. Any comment? Or question up to that point before now we look at the meat of it. Yes, please. Just just take the microphone for recording purposes. Show how important it is. Yes. When God begins to go horizontal. Mm -hmm. And he begins with the people that we interact with first in this world, which are our parents. Of course. And how to heed and listen to them and to obey them. And he puts even a promise on it. Yes, of course. That's the first commandment with a promise. I, I can't agree with you more. I can't agree with you more. It surely must show the importance of parents in our lives, doesn't it? It shows the importance of parents in our lives. Because God recognizes that importance. And so after talking about the relationship between ourselves and him, the first person he goes to is the parents. Isn't it? That surely, that arrangement, surely it is not, it is not by coincidence. That's what I'm trying to say. It is not by coincidence that that is what comes next. It is, it is a thought-out arrangement, if you like. It is a wise arrangement of it by God. You know, there is a way in which, even in Leviticus, look at Leviticus 19 verse 3, and you'll see something of what I'm trying to say. The way, you know, God, God speaks of our relationship with him and almost concurrently with, with the relationship we have with parents. Look at Leviticus 19. And you know, Leviticus 19 is, is, is about the holiness of God. Isn't it? That the Lord is holy. 
Let me read from verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, I am holy. Are we together? Verse 3. Every one of you shall revere what? His mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Like Pastor Tony would say, thus says the Lord. Why is he mixing the issue of his holiness with respect for parents? Are you seeing how close those things are, are put together in the word of God? I think, I could be wrong, but I think that it is not by coincidence. I think it is to show the priority of the place that parents have in the life of their children. It shows that that priority that parents have in the life of their children. Now, with that said, and since we don't have questions, let us now look at part one. Yes. Please, go, go right ahead. Huh? Um, my question is this. Would you say this instruction applies to the younger also hearing the older? Would you say that the instructions apply to the younger? Younger people, uh -huh. uh, respecting or hearing the older as parents, or it is just specifically to your parents? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Now, we, we are going to expand uh, that eh, later, but what we will eventually show is that when it comes to listening, here, specifically, he's talking about parents. Eh? But we will find that in application, by the time we reach even, say, the pastoral letters, eh? we'll find, for example, how to treat older people around you. Okay? And we'll find that older people are supposed to be treated with respect. Okay? We will find, for example, how, why it is important to listen to your church leaders. All right? So we will expand it up to that point. But for now, we are concentrating on, on parents. Okay? So for now, we are concerned. But thank you for that question. Now, what is the wisdom behind listening to parents? The wisdom of listening to parents. What is that wisdom? Actually, this is part two. We will just finish the introduction. Why do you think we should listen to parents? You know, my Bible study is always interactive. We, we have to answer questions, yes? Why do we listen to parents, Mama Jean? Well, she says they are wiser. Yes, someone else? Yes, Pastor? Because God says so. That is actually supposed to be number one. So when you have number one answer, you give it first. Eh? So because... God says so. Yes? Someone else? Yes, Mama Junior. They? They have experience. Not necessarily first, first hand, but they have experience. Yes, Mama Chumpe? They have your best interest at heart. Uh -huh. Someone else? Yes. Pardon? You will live longer. Uh -huh. According to that student, you will live longer. Yes? Someone else? Mama CJ, you had your hand up, but I hadn't pointed. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Why should... What is the wisdom in it? Right? What is the wisdom in it? I think. Yes. Uh -huh. Peaceful living or peaceful coexistence. 
You are all right. All of you are right. Yes, Deacon. To? To receive their inheritance. I think that's a very bad reason. That, 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 I would not add that reason to the board. I think as a teacher, I have some discretion, isn't it? Which, which answer I can add to the board. Eh? I think that should not be the, the wisdom behind listening to them. That, you know, let me just listen to you so that when you die, I get your car. I, I, I think that should not be the motivating factor because then that turns us into worldliness. So that is why I'm not adding it eh, onto the board. <coughs> yes, my pastor. Okay, to receive blessings. To receive blessings. Now, in this place of wise, do you think that they also have knowledge? You may not have. Isn't it? They may have knowledge that you may not have. Simply by virtue of longevity. They have been around longer. When I was a little boy, one of the things my mother would say often, anytime any one of our, our siblings, ourselves and our siblings, and we were seven of us, anytime any one of us appeared to challenge her, she would tell that person that, I have to directly translate this one, that I have seen the sun more times than you have seen it. All right? I have seen the sun more times than you have seen it. That means that she has seen the sun rising. Rising several more times than you yourself have seen it. Basically telling you that I have therefore seen many things, had much more knowledge, had much more experience, that you would, than you would have. Therefore, just listen to me. So, one of the reasons, one of the basis or the wisdom of listening to parents is their knowledge. Their knowledge. But even before we come to their knowledge, we say that it is because God, who is all wise, has said so. God has said so. It is in the word of God in Proverbs that we see where the Proverbist is saying, Hear, my son, your father's instructions. And you know what we mean by hearing, isn't it? Take it into account. Consider it. Consider it. Listen to it. Listen to it. Have regard for what your parents are telling you. God is saying so in his word. For this is the word of God, isn't it? This is the word of God. And in it, God is saying that it is a good thing for him and for us if we were to listen to our parents. Now, you can't beat that more than I'm beating it. It will not produce any other sound even if it was a drum. God says so, we do it. Because obeying God means that we already presume his wisdom. Isn't it? We presume that God is wise. For him to tell us to obey our parents, he knows what he is talking about. Isn't it? He knows what he is talking about. But secondly, knowledge. The knowledge of your parents. Your parents know you probably better than anyone else that you interact with. I am told, I do not know how true it is, that Maasai's, Maasai's, the Maa community, when a child is born and they are still toddlers, they take a piece of skin, hide, you know, hide, dry hide. They take a, a hide that is dry, they put the child's foot and trace it and cut it with a knife. And then they keep it and hang it. Any day that child 
tries to be rude to the parent, they are shown the size of their feet on the day they were born. And they come down immediately. They come down immediately. They are told when you were born, this was the size of your, your foot. Now you want to use to kick me. This is how it used to look like. And the children, they take obedience immediately. Your parents know you. They fed you when you were unable to feed yourself. When you would soil your own clothes and yourself, they cleaned you. They lovingly clothed you with the best that they had at their disposal. They changed your diapers if they were diapers then. Or napkins in our days, because in our days there were no diapers. They used napkins on us. So they, they are the ones who did this. At the point when you were unable to speak and to even say that you are hungry, that the best you could do was to wail and cry, they would somehow figure out what you needed and supply it for your comfort. That's what your parents do for you. Little Jude there totally depends on Judy, our sister. Totally he depends on Judy. If Judy was to say today that she is not going to take care of Jude, little Jude would die probably within a day. If there was no one. In fact, even if he was, he was left with the father, and the mother said, enough is enough, no milk, suckle from your breast if you like. This guy would struggle. He would not know what to do. He would not know what to do. The parent is that important in our lives. And these parents, they see you grow, don't they? There are so many decisions that your parents made on your behalf that have now made you who you are. There was a point in life when you were not able to make decisions for yourself, isn't it? Which school to go to, even when to start going to school. So these days you're saying, I'm professor, doctor, you know, engineer, advocate, you know, architect. You know, Lewis, we must have something before our names. Eh? Architect this, you know. But there was a person who made decisions on your behalf. For example, when to start going to school. Which school to go to. Isn't it? They make these decisions for us. Sometimes even in choosing our careers, they help us. And they tell us, from the way I see you, maybe you could do this. Don't struggle too much with this line. Try this one. And because they love us, they do this to us. They know us personally. So because of that, because of their knowledge, because of their knowledge of us, they have the potential to provide better advice than anyone else. Not even your teachers. Not even your counselors, who probably see you only for a few minutes, isn't it? Or even friends who may be motivated to tell you just what you want to hear because they know that if, if, they, tell you, if they tell you that you are on the wrong path, you will feel bad, isn't it? You will feel bad, isn't it? You remember what the example I gave of the counseling of the young man who wants to marry or the young girl who, is, who wants to be married. And they go to the pastor, isn't it? And they tell pastor, pastor, now pastor Tony, uh, pastor, I have met a young man who wants to marry me. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> My daughter there is looking at me and I'm not talking about her. <laughs> you know, so they tell the pastor and the pastor then investigates. And the pastor tells uh, my daughter there, I don't think this young man is good for you. He is not good for you. I found out that he is not a believer. I've checked his background from the pastor in his church, and he has not believed. And I know you that you are a believer, so I don't think he is the right one for you. Why don't you wait? But what does she think? This pastor does not want me to wear. To do what to wear? 
and enjoy my love life with this young man. So I will not listen to him. But the pastor could be such a pastor, not Pastor Tony though, but one who would not like to upset her. So he tells her what she thinks, he thinks she wants to hear. Oh, the young man is good. Even if he's not a believer, he will be a believer as we go along. <laughs> Just go on. Because that is what she wants to, to hear. But your parents rarely would do that. They would tell you the truth. They would tell you the truth because they have knowledge of who you are. So no one has a better opportunity to know what you need than your parents, averagely speaking, generally speaking. But two, three in my notes is their experience. Their experience. Your parents have been where you are, haven't they? They have been where you are. Sometimes when we are all like this and we have got gray hair, people think us we are not young one day. Even us we used to be young. Our parents used to be young. They also grew up, they were also toddlers. And they were also instructed by their parents. Our parents were where we now are. And in fact, they are now where we are headed. Are you, are you catching that? They used to be where we are, where we are, and secondly, they are now where we are going. That is if we live as long as them. Even us, we will be like them. We are headed there. If God tarries and he gives us life, we will be like them. So sometimes as you give advice to your children, and they also give you advice, you can tell them that one day you will be where I am. And these things that I'm telling you, you may also find them necessary to tell to your children. Let's wait and see how they will respond. Now that your attitude to me is to, to despise what I'm saying. We are going there. The commentary that I was using to prepare for this Bible study used an example that I want to use. So this is not my example. This is an example I've borrowed. The writer says this, that parents are like sergeants who are leading army squads. More often than not, the sergeants will be older, more experienced men, more likely battle-hardened. They have survived what the new recruits are yet to even experience. It would be folly for a new recruit, a private, not to listen to his sergeant as they face the enemy. Is that a true statement? The sergeant who is battle-hardened, he has been to war before, he is leading his squad, and they are new soldiers, new recruits, they are facing the enemy. If he would advise them not to do certain things, they would be foolish if they went and do, did the exact same thing. And so it is. Children with parents are in fact blessed to have advice from those who have traveled the same road only that they have traveled it much further. They can turn back and tell you, please, do this or don't do that. Proverbs 4, verse 1 to 4. Someone read Proverbs 4, verse 1 to 4. Proverbs 4, 1 to 4. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. 
for I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender the only, tender the only one in the sight of my mother. He taught me and he said, and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Are you seeing what we have just been saying? This guy is saying, even me as I'm teaching you, my son, I used to be a son like you. When I was a toddler, a young man with my father, he taught me. You see that? It is a repeated thing. My father also taught me. And he told me, if you listen to these things, you will live. You will live. Isn't that connected with the promise? In the commandment of fearing, of, of giving honor to your father and your mother, isn't it tied to living, to long life? It is. There is a way in which honoring parents have to do with a better life. It may not be long in terms of, of duration, longevity, but it, may, it will probably be much more fulfilling than the life of that young man or young lady who does not listen to their parents. So parents have that accumulated wisdom. Several generations. Their wisdom may also include the wisdom of God. So you would even be better off if you have got believing parents. If you've got believing parents. You are much the luckier if there is something called luck. You are much the better for it. If your parents are those who believe in God, they are born again. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Because then their advice to you would be an advice that is that that is that that has, is rubbed off from with the word of God. There is a connection with the word of God in it. Now, if we say that we, we didn't have, maybe some people say, oh, oh, but me, I didn't have godly parents. My parents were not believers. And so maybe I didn't. Well, so what should we do about it? Are we therefore not ourselves supposed to be godly so that we may give godly advice to, to our children? Isn't it? Should we then not strive ourselves to come to Christ in faith? and know him personally and have a relationship with him, even that we may know him and his ways, and then hand over that to our children. That they may not complain like those who, of us now who may complain that we do not have godly parents. Charismatics talk about generational curses, isn't it? Well, if that is a generational curse, that is how to cut it. You be a believer so that your children will get good advice. If there is a generation of cast, that is how to sever it. Not laying on of, of hands or pouring oil. It is to turn to God, isn't it? It is to turn to God ourselves so that then our children would benefit from our godliness. Even if we are not perfect in our own life, and it is highly unlikely that we would be perfect, but then our children will be able to then benefit from our godly lives and our godly advice. So that children with Christians as parents are more blessed because the wisdom that their parents give them have the source of the word of God, the place where wisdom resides. You remember Christ, who is the encapsulation of all wisdom and knowledge? Colossians chapter 2, you remember? Yes. That's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And those who have a relationship with him, who seek to serve him, are restrained by his grace to be wise. The wisdom of listening to one's parents is a no-brainer. Only, only, very, only very weird characters would refuse to listen to their parents. Proverbs 15.5, for reference. Proverbs 15.5. Just stand with me there. 
Look what happens according to the, wis the wisdom of Solomon. Someone read Proverbs 15.5. Proverbs 15.5. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever hates reproof is prudent. Is prudent. Only a fool, that's why I'm saying it's an problem. Only a fool who despise godly advice from their parents. Only a fool would not listen to their parents. Hear, my son, your father's instructions, and forsake not your mother's teaching. The principle there is that both parents must be respected. Yes. Uh, just to get it uh, correctly, to translate the word prudent to mean to be careful mm -hmm. or to be cautious. Who wants to tell us what prudent prudence means? What is the meaning of prudence? Pardon? Prudence is actually the other word for wisdom. Diligence, isn't it? Careful, if you like. Wise, wise. That's prudence, isn't it? Are we okay? Sister Marceline, you are raising your hand and... Okay. We are told who despises a parent's advice. He's called what? A fool. The Bible does not have very nice or kind words for people who don't listen to godly advice. That, that's that's, that's a, one of the funny things I found out in the book of Proverbs as you read. Anytime... Anytime someone tries to avoid listening to God, he calls that person a fool. There is no other softer language that I have seen here. Uh, that person is the opposite of wise, eh? is foolishness. Although now, the problem with the foolishness in Proverbs is it is not just foolishness which you can walk around with. And say, okay, it is a, you, you have called me a fool, it will not stick to my shirt. As I go through the gate, no one will know that you called me a fool. Uh, uh, uh. It is foolishness that actually sticks on to you. Because it has something to do with your life. And the end of your life. So it is actually foolishness that will affect you eternally. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, is, not, it is not foolishness where someone has insulted you and you say, ah, I am your you know? That, you know, insults don't stick on me. No, it is actually that's something that you will walk with to eternity unless it is changed by the wisdom of God. So it is not a very kind word that we should take lightly. Any question before I go to part two or comment? Because I want to erase this. beauty of listening to parents or the reward of listening to parents. Yes. Just, just give me this one. Uh, I'm probably thinking that uh, you, you may address this in the future. Um, just so that uh, I'm trying to preempt in someone's mind here this morning. Yes, yes. What if you are a Christian and your parents are not Christians and you seem to be 
disagreeing on certain issues and matters, how do you navigate since we are clearly instructed to listen to our parents and to receive their wisdom? So how, as a Christian, do you navigate that? You are a Christian, they are not Christians. And so you clash. Yeah. Just how that can be handled in the future. Yes. Yeah. So pastor is raising a very important issue that definitely we will tackle. You are a Christian, but your parents are not Christians. And are in the course of their so-called wisdom to you, you clash. So how do you handle it? Who has an idea? Preferably a godly idea. <laughs> Not that you just, <laughs> just beat them out and get them out of the house. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so I think of first importance, it will be important to note that that does not mean we despise their wisdom, that we are Christians and not Christians, but um, the wisdom we apply from them is restricted uh, to the point of it not leading us to sin. So if it goes against God's uh, set precepts, then we will not see that as wisdom, because the, uh, the, way, the way we were also folly once, the same way they are still folly in their sins, so they might give wisdom that does not go in line with God's word. So as at that, you would uh, choose to honor God and disobey them at that point, but totally note that you are supposed to disobey them because you are a Christian and they are not. Yes. Any other uh, opinion? Uh, yes. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So, Ephesians? Chapter 6, verse 1. Uh -huh. Read. Children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In the Lord. Uh -huh. Any other? I, I, I think um, we would seek to tell them if um, a parent offers advice that is contrary to God's word, we would seek to win them over and uh, tell them that um, we are Christians. And this is what the Bible says. And um, try just to convince them mm -hmm. to see what your thoughts are in light of God's word. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yes, Darius. Thank you. Thank you for those, Darius. Yeah, sometimes it uh, it requires patience uh, as you come to a place of understanding each other. So we are from the side of a believer, uh, we may have to to learn patience. Mm -hmm. There is a sense in which parents are in a position of authority over us, isn't it? Do we agree with that? By virtue of them, them being parents. They are in a position of authority over us. They, they, they hold a position, a superior position. And so we are supposed to be subservient to them in our obedience. But comes that problem where he talks about where the parent is not a believer. And maybe what they are telling you to do is clearly ungodly. It's an ungodly thing that they're instructing you to do, for example. Then I think we can turn back to the word of God, can't we? To find out how does the word of God instruct us to deal with those who are in positions of authority over us, but would want us to do things which are not right before God. Isn't it? Under those circumstances, we are supposed to obey who? We are supposed to obey who? God. Why are you not confident? <laughs> Under those circumstances, we are supposed to obey God and not man. And that is what is in Acts chapter 5. You remember that story between uh, the Apostle Paul when they were arrested and, and then, then they were freed after being beaten. You remember that, that story? Verse 27 of chapter 5 of Acts. I do not know, but I think, Pastor, this could have been, they were in Philippi. 
they were in Jerusalem. And then, are we there? Verse 27. We, we, we read, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. This must be the Sanhedrin, isn't it? They set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in, the, in this name. Yet here, you have, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter, it was actually Peter, I was confusing that. But Peter and the apostles answered, are we there? We must obey who? God rather than men. So whenever there is a conflict between obeying what is godly and what is not godly, it's, it's straightforward. We obey God rather than man. Yet, even as we do so, we must remember these parents hold a position of superiority over, over us. And we go back to the same Bible. And see now, how do you deal with those who are older than you? And if you are here when I was teaching church discipline, you remember what I said. If there are those who are older than you, particularly those who are in leadership position in the church, and you find that they have fallen into sin, you should not confront them in the same manner as you would confront another person. All right? They, you do it in a discreet way. So then even you we don't have time so that we can't read all that. But you were there, you heard me say this. this. You probably do it in a more respectful way. You don't just tell pastor right in front of people here, a pastor Kwenda Uko, you know, you even knew what is wrong with you. You are doing a mistake, you know. That, that would be wrong. That would be wrong. You would probably walk to him in his office and tell him, you know, Pastor, how are you? I'm, you know, Pastor, I don't know how to tell you this. No, no, just, so even him is encouraging. Just, just tell me. Pastor, you know, that you are teaching us that thing, but hey, me, it couldn't make sense to me. In fact, I think that I don't know, but please don't feel bad. I think maybe you made a mistake. Could it be that you made a mistake? Or me, maybe I'm the one who didn't hear properly. You know? And, and you put him in such a situation that you don't want to embarrass him so that tomorrow he does not have the guts to stand before you and preach the word of God to you. The Bible says you must even have more than two witnesses. Two or three. It's not just one or two. Two or three. And deal with the matter in a discreet and respectful manner. I would think by parity of reasoning that that is how we are supposed to deal with our parents. Ama. Oh, you just stand and tell your parents, oh, daddy, kwenda uko, ata we ujui hizi vitu. You know, you don't do that. Or mami, go away. No, 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 you don't do that. You do it in a respectful way that the parents still feel that they are parents. It's not the same way that you would rebuke a friend in, in school. These things, we find them in the Bible, and we can use them. You remember the three Ps? These are principles, precedents, and precepts that we can use to know what God's will is, even as we have. That is now wisdom. That is now wisdom. The beauty of listening to your parents, as I run to close, the writer of Proverbs compares a person who listens to their parent and gives them an image that it will be like a garland. Do you know what a garland is? What is a garland? Now, Jude, you have to tell us. You know, Jude is sitting where he sits, then he just realizes. <laughs> but yes, he, you have to tell us what a gala is. <laughs> it is the ceremonial necklace put on the neck that hangs as a sign of um, celebration or Victory, honor. Victory, honor. We see that more amongst the Asian community, isn't it? Where you come from, my sister. They, they will do flowers, isn't it? And thread the flowers and then they put around the, the important person so that they look 
flowery and beautiful. Ladies here put necklaces around their necks, isn't it? Those are like garlands also to enhance their beauty, isn't it? These days when you go for graduation ceremonies, there's this idea which has come. People just put those flickery, flickery things. Eh? You've seen those are garlands. Bling, bling, Christmas. Uh, those ones. They, they throw them all over the place. And, and, and there are people who are business minded. When they hear there is a, 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 a graduation, they manufacture those things that same day and bring them. And when they are leaving, those people who have taken photos and thrown them away, they collect again and go to another graduation. Those things are called gallants. Now, he says that those sons or daughters who listen to their parents, their wisdom is like a garland around their necks. They will be honored. They are like people who are honored. They are like those accessories that you wear to make yourself even more beautiful or more handsome if you are a man. Children are made attractive to society if they are those who have been listening to their parents. They become more attractive to society. These days, even secular songs are not good. When I was growing up, there used to be some Tanzanians who used to sing in Kiswahili. This man says, Baba yangu na mama yangu, muli nifundisha vile kuishi na walimwengu. Now that I'm on my own, ninaishi na uvizuri. Kwa sababu muli nifundisha. You know, long time, even secular songs used to make sense. Not these days of poop to a poop to a pan. Even you don't know what they are saying. Those days you could listen to those Kiswahili songs and they say, Baba yangu, nina shukuru sana kwa sababu muli nifundisha. Sasa, nina ishi na watu vizuri. Because you taught me. I listened to your advice. You told me how to live with people in the world. Now I benefit. The man sings like that. He is a Tanzanian. I do not know his name. But I know that he is a Tanzanian. Children who listen to the advice of their parents become more attractive to society. If my son Noel, Mimi ndiyo hamenishinda kwa nyumba. Mbaka na muambia, wewe nenda ulimungu itakufundi? Itakufundisha. It basically means that on the day I'm not there, if you should fall into Pastor Tony's hands, who was my friend to take care of him? Tony will say, this boy, even his parents, never used to handle him. Isn't it? There is nothing I can, I can do for him. They are saying in Luo that the tree which a monkey cannot climb, let a baboon not try. A baboon has no business trying that tree if a monkey cannot climb it. And that is what happens to children who have not listened to their parents. They become offensive to society. It is now no longer a garland around their necks. They are a stench to society. Someone has said that a garland is that filial respect and obedience will be like an ornament as a crown as a diadem, as a golden crown, pearls on that child as he engages society. Children who revere their parents by heeding their counsel are made more attractive and more appealing. Compare that with the ugliness of parental disrespect. <laughs> Do not forsake means to hold on to. Hold on to. Don't let it slip. Here, do not forsake your mother's teaching. It means, therefore, that as parents, we ourselves have the responsibility of teaching our children, both husband and wife, okay? Both of us, both of us have, you know, let us not be in a situation where a child does wrong and then you just, I'll tell your father. Help the child yourself. 
Yes, the father is the head of the home and is overall in charge of everything, but that does not stop the mother from helping the child. Or you are this man who says, okay, you are doing your, I'll tell your mom. You remember that one, my wife will deal with you. The one, that story we had. The, the man is a weakling, so you, you threaten him, he says, my wife will deal with you. Okay? Well, you, we are supposed to join forces together, speak in one voice as parents, we do, so that we don't have a situation where Mama Achumpe is telling Achumpe that you know your father is very bad. And this guy, Ezra, is also telling Achumpe, it is your mother who is very bad. There you are not speaking in one voice. If it is the welfare of the child that both of you have, you speak in one voice to help. That is why the proverb is as he writes, speaks about both the father and the mother. This is a good thing to be done by both of you. Yes, the father is the head of the house. But mothers, give teaching. Fathers, instruct your children in the ways of God. That wisdom will be like a graceful gallant on your head, beautiful pendant on your neck. Proverbs 30, verse 1, as I close. Proverbs 30. Verse 1, then we'll jump to verse 11. This is the words of Agur, one of the writers of the Proverbs. The words of Agur, son of Jake, the oracle. The man declares, I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God. And worn out. Go to verse 11. So first of all, we see the state. The state of, of a person. Because why is there weariness? It's because of the life of fallen, the fallenness of life, isn't it? That's why there is weariness. Come at verse 11. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. They do not honor their mothers. Proverbs 1 that there is going to be a tragic end. And that's why I said that foolishness is not just for now. There is a, a tragic end for those who dishonor their parents. While your fingers are still in verse 30, look at verse 7, uh, chapter 30, look at verse 7. The one who keeps the law is a son with understanding, but a companion of gluttons shames. His father. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, that is uh, 28. 28, I'm sorry about that. 28, verse, chapter 28. 28, verse 7. Sorry about that. So as we conclude, we say ourselves we are privileged because we are fort fortunate to live under God's law. A time of grace, long suffering of God, he has saved us. We have known him as a merciful God. But even in our day and age, there are those who still would despise not only the wisdom of their parents, but even the wisdom of God, and not one to have regard for God. The law of Christ in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, expects children to obey their parents, isn't it? Ephesians says that. We should obey our parents. Our brother read it. We should obey our parents. Even Jesus honored his parents. You look at Luke, Chapter, 50, chapter 2, verse 50 or 51, Luke says that Christ also obeyed his parents. He honored them. 
Not that that increased Jesus' wisdom because he was wise anyway. But the Bible teaches that he increased in favor with God for his obedience. And his own example illustrates that for us. That we should obey our parents. That we should honor our fathers and our mothers. That this is pleasing to God because God says so. So friends, may the wisdom of your own parents grace your neck like a gallant. May they be like a crown on your head. But may your own wisdom also grace the necks of your children. Your own wisdom obtained from the word of God. Your own wisdom out of your knowledge of God and your love for him. May that wisdom also grace the necks of your children as gallants. May that wisdom become like a crown on top of your children's head. So he is a wise man who catechizes his children, isn't it? Pointing them always towards who Christ is. Urging them to know him. Urging them to know him and to have a relationship with him. And if you be amongst us here and you are not a believer, friend, go to Christ. That I will never tire saying as long as I do Proverbs from this podium. Go to Christ. Ask him to save you. He is our only source of help. Better than even the advice parents give, go to Christ. Go to Christ. Plead with him for mercy. For you are a sinner. Just like I am. Plead to Christ and ask him to forgive you your sins. And to cleanse you with the blood of Christ. That washes as white as snow. And to make you his friend. A child of God. And have a relationship with him. And be saved. And be saved. There is no better wisdom than that. Of all the wisdom that I've seen, even from my own little study, there is no better wisdom than the fear of God. The relational fear of God in Christ Jesus, in whom is the depository of all wisdom and all knowledge. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says that he is he is the, the image of God in human form. The entirety of the triune God in human form. Christ, the repository of all wisdom and knowledge. Have a relationship with him. Any question or comment?